everyone. We appreciate you being here this evening. This is the seventh panel we've had in our uh, Valpo at Work series uh, during the month of April. These are opportunities for students to learn more about different occupations, industries, fields. And tonight it's uh, renewable clean energy. And we have three industry experts, professionals who all work in different sectors. And we look forward to talking with them. Students, you can um, ask your questions through the chat box, please. Um, and Jenny Marley from the College of Engineering here at Valpo is going to moderate this this evening. But students, glad you're here. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, and thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be here. Uh, this program is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch the replay on the Valpo Career Center YouTube channel at some point if you'd like to. Okay. Um, we have Brianna Schroeder here, Kenny Wee, and Dan Trapp. And I'm going to let them talk a little bit. I'll turn it over to Jenny, but they can tell you a little bit about their backgrounds um, as as the evening, as the hour rolls on. Okay. Thanks again for everyone being here. We appreciate it. And uh, Jenny, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to get us started a little bit, but feel free to again put your questions in the chat. We really want to get your input for what you're interested to hear about. So for each of our panelists, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to get into this very broad industry of renewable energy. Where do you want to start, Jenny? Uh, why don't you get us started, if you will? OK, I don't want to talk over anybody. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Schrader. I'm an attorney in Indianapolis, Indiana. I got my master's in international commerce and policy and my law degree from Valparaiso um, back in 2009 uh, through the dual degree program. And since then, um, just to give you the, the thumbnail sketch, I guess, of how I ended up doing what I'm doing, I uh, graduated and immediately started working um, in environmental law and representing uh, a lot of property owners with environmental problems and helped them find ways to remediate the issue, whatever it was. Um, did that for a while, um, as often happens, you know, met a guy, uh, ended up moving to Chicago for a few years, um, working for a big firm up there, and then convinced the guy to move uh, back down to Indianapolis. And so now I'm at a small firm. I've done medium, large, and now I'm at a small two attorney firm, um, Jansen Schrader Ag Law out of Indianapolis. And um, still do some environmental work, do a lot of work for agricultural entities, businesses, tech companies, those sort of things. But from the renewable energy perspective, <clears throat> one of the areas we get really involved in are negotiating things like solar contracts, uh, navigating the zoning issues related to developing a renewable energy source like wind or solar. Um, we also do some work um, in the incredibly sexy world of manure digesters, um, which requires a lot of complex contracts between different parties. Um, and, and so, those are just a few of the areas. Um, lately, we've seen more and more about carbon sequestration, especially in ag properties or rural properties. And um, again, contracts play a large role in that. So we've been getting more and more involved. I can say my career now compared to 10 years ago, um, it's, it's wildly different today than it was, you know, when I graduated from law school in 2009. So happy to talk uh, more and answer questions as the night goes on. Looking forward to a good conversation with Kenny and Dan. All right. Well, I can go next. My name is Kenny Wee, and I currently work for Tredebi Environmental Services. As the technical director, I also currently manage the engineering group in the U.S., Tridebi is a multinational company, so headquartered in Barcelona. And so we have a presence in Europe and in Spain. And um, up until recently, we uh, had a large project in Oman as well. Um, I think one thing, since we're talking to uh, students who are you know, contemplating their future, uh, what they wanna do afterwards, how their degree will be applicable to uh, you know, different fields. And I'm sure there's 
some enthusiasm and optimism, but a little bit of anxiety as well. I can share from personal experience, what you study does not is not necessarily what you will do uh, 100%. What I mean by that, it may not match up 100%, but that's okay. Because once you get out and start working, you're going to be uh, faced with opportunities. And then you're going to have to choose if you want to take advantage of it or not. And once you choose, it kind of leads you down that road for a while until you choose to change. If you choose to change or another opportunity comes around. And so I'll just give you a quick example in terms of my career path. I won't go into it too long. But uh, when I graduated from UCLA with a degree in biology, I actually first ended up in manufacturing and I worked for a rubber compounding company that compounded rubber seals for brake lines, for oil rigs, for all types of uh, industry where you needed those, uh, you know, seals to keep air or fluid in. And actually, I enjoyed it because it was kind of complex. There were different rubber compounds, different adhesives and everything. And the project I was given there, I, I was in California, of course, was the company needed to reduce the emissions of the adhesives that they used because South Coast Air Quality Management District in California is very strict. So I worked on a project to transition the company from an uh, solvent-based adhesives to water-based adhesives. And it was important for them. And it was even more important for them. Whatever we transitioned to met all of the standards, testing specifications, whatever. And so that was actually a lot of fun. We had some successes there. Um, from there, I transitioned into paint manufacturing, water-based paint. Um, I worked with uh, a senior paint technologist, chemist, to build a few uh, factories, and that was a lot of fun, too. From there, I moved on um, to work in biodiesel when it was just first starting to be really popular. And at that point, we took virgin um, soybean oil, converted it to biodiesel. And even then, and now when I look back at it, when you take virgin oil, it's not quite the most sustainable thing because it's, there's always, in my view anyways, there's always a competition between uh, land and resources being grown for food versus for fuel. And are you using more energy and so forth to produce that uh, biodiesel that has a less, less of a carbon footprint, but you, know, you balance that against every, all the carbon and energy that's that goes into making or refining that oil into biodiesel. And from there, I, I went into wastewater treatment uh, in Hawaii. I worked at a wastewater treatment plant for a company that took all of the sludge and put it in an anaerobic digester, like Brianna was kind of talking about. And that produced a lot of biogas that we use to actually heat what we call a kiln to dry the uh, sludge from the wastewater treatment plant and make fertilizer out of it. And it went on to farms to grow produce and everything. And that was all really cool. But then once again, uh, things change, right? Because now we, uh, 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 perfluorinated uh, compounds are a real problem and sludge can contain that. So now those fertilizer pellets being put out on farms, there's the possibility that, you know, you may be you know, spreading PF, uh, PFS uh, out there, and that could be, an, so there's always an evolution as we go along in the industry, we're always finding new things, which is cool in solving problems. And I also work uh, on a project where we took hard to recycle plastic, melted it down, vaporized it, condensed it, and then that synthetic oil, we shipped it back to the refinery and then they mixed it with their crude oil. So that therefore we uh, recycled plastic in that way, extracting oil, the oil back out of it and recycling that. And that, that was good. But at the same time, that plastic also contained a lot of heavy metals and the residual carbon uh, that was from that process went to landfill. Uh, so there was still some waste there. And, and currently I work in at Tredebi, it's an environmental services company where it incorporates both the manufacturing aspect of uh, my prior uh, jobs, and then also new things that I'm learning in terms of environmental 
regulation and new technologies that we have to treat waste, recover uh, the energy, uh, recycle the products that can be recycled and the things that need to be dis disposed of, whether it be uh, uh, through wastewater or through landfill to do that uh, responsibly. So that's kind of my path so far. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll pick up the baton here. Um, I love how diverse our backgrounds here are with Brianna more on the legal side of things and, and Kenny on the engineering environmental services side. I am on neither part of that. I uh, look at markets uh, writ large. So I work at Semper LNG in San Diego and I have a background in liquefied natural gas. So not completely renewables, but by looking at that, I really need to understand the global, um, the global energy picture and what's going on. My background uh, in energy really started after I finished my master's at GW. My, uh, just going back to my bachelor's at Valpo, I got an international economics and cultural affairs and German degree with a minor in history and didn't know what to do with it. So I went to Germany and worked in a logistics company for a couple of years. And then a bunch of friends were moving to Washington DC from Valpo, uh, Valpo grads were moving there. And so I thought that'd be a fun time to, to move there and see what was happening. And so I moved there and uh, knew I wanted to do something international, but wasn't sure exactly how that would fit together. And so what I ended up doing was uh, talking to people in diplomacy, in national security, in banking, in energy, the fields that really have something to do with global affairs. And uh, I decided that I really didn't want to be in, uh, in the defense world. Unfortunately, I'd already started a security policy studies degree at GW. Um, so I pivoted. And... Um, I uh, also decided that the government just generally wasn't for me and banking, I would have needed a different kind of degree. So energy seemed like a really good, good place to go. And what I focused on, focused on then at, um, at GW was political risk and energy. So the national security side, international security side of energy and how that impacts countries and markets and companies. And when I finished there, I started with a small consulting company in Washington, D.C., where we looked at uh, liquefied natural gas markets around the world, and it's been a growing field and displaces coal in a lot of number of, uh, number of markets, which is why I like it the best in thinking about LNG as a transitional fuel. But the part that comes to renewables and comes to what I'm sure a lot of you are looking at is the, uh, the sense that the world is changing. There's an energy transition going on. Companies realize it. My company is looking at what kinds of things we can do to transition. I'm part of the non-regulated side, but there's a regulated utility side that announced this last week that they're looking to go net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2045. It's a long-term kind of thing, uh, in my opinion, but, um, but those planning kind of things start now that, uh, that put things in place for later. Um, I'm going to switch my screen here because I'm only seeing one or two people. Um, there we go. It, I'm just seeing one, one head nod and it's a little distracting. Uh, Zoom calls are still um, still a good thing. Um, a couple of things just uh, in terms of, of uh, following up on what Brianna and Kenny said. Uh, I'm sure you will learn that uh, there's a number of things that you can figure out in your career in a number of different ways. Uh, I, like I said, started in international economics in German and I'm now working in a, in a company that's looking more at global affairs in the energy side. So it, it does bring some of those threads together from my undergrad, but it's really been, a, my career has been a, a, a time of thinking, what do I wanna learn? What kind of skills do I wanna develop? How do I wanna grow in the future? And I'm still doing that today. So as you think about your career moving forward, ask yourself, what kinds of things do you wanna learn? What do you wanna do? Who do you wanna work with? Where do you wanna live? Those kind of things are always really helpful in, in terms of, um, of um, just how you frame your career. And then one, fi <clears throat> one final thing, one of the reasons that I initially thought of getting into energy was a class I had, an econ class, my senior year, where we were talking about the economics of developing nations. And one of the takeaways I had that I've, I've since seen in a number of markets is that, that students in Sub-Saharan Africa couldn't, um, didn't have the same kind of access to education partially because they didn't have electricity at home to study at night. They didn't have the same kind of water resources. Um, a lot of different poverty issues that, that could have been handled or solved or, or improved 
with energy that's affordable, reliable, and clean. And so as I think about my career and I think about this transition, I wonder what can I do in my role in a corporate kind of job in thinking, how do we solve some of that problem in my lifetime? And that's been a guiding theme throughout my career. So I'm happy to answer your questions as we go forward and, and look forward to a good conversation. Great, thank you. So one of the themes that you all have pointed out is how the industry is changing. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, both looking back how you've seen the industry change and then maybe where you think it might be going if you have any thoughts on that as well. I can speak to the the macro kind of uh, corporate side. With LNG, we, um, Semper especially, is looking at what we can do to, um, to be a part of the energy transition in the world. And so as we think about uh, what that means, it's looking at what our customers want, what markets are, are thinking about developing. Uh, one of the key target markets for LNG is Southeast Asia because they need large scale affordable energy pretty much now in the next 10 years. Renewables need batteries to solve the issue of intermittency. And so as we think about LNG in that kind of market, that's what we look at and we think about how that can um, help achieve the, the energy needs they need in the near term without being as dirty as a coal-fired power plant. LNG natural gas is, is, um, uh, emits less emissions in a number of different ways. It's not a perfect fuel at all. And so in the long term, as we think about what kind of options are out there, uh, the market has shifted to thinking about how hydrogen can be a, a part of the process. And there's all kinds of different hydrogen made by either fossil fuels or renewables. Ideally, you would you would make hydrogen with renewable electricity and an electrolyzer and then be able to use that as a more clean burning fuel. But the technology isn't there right now. And so as we think about planning into the future, hydrogen is there, renewables, carbon capture and storage, all kinds of things to be able to reduce the carbon footprint. But I'm sure Kenny and Brianna have different takes on the, the different perspectives we have. I'd be curious what they have to say too. I, I did want to piggyback on what Dan just said about LNG, because I do pretty much agree with what Dan said about LNG being a good, very good transitional fuel, which it, it's kind of already proven itself in the sense that it has lowered, uh, uh, you know, pollution from uh, coal burning power plants. Um, and it, it's a great fuel for power plants at the current time. I'll just give you an example as well. When I lived in Hawaii, all the plants there uh, are, they have three classification of plants. The, the largest number of plants burn diesel fuel just because that's what they can get. And there are a couple of refineries there as well. So the, the plants, I mean, that's like super old school. It's burning diesel fuel to make electricity for the island. There's no way they're gonna put a nuclear power plant there that can power the whole island. It's just, they're not gonna do it. Um, even though they got, subs and everything there at, at Pearl Harbor and everything, they, they just don't want nuclear, right? And then uh, the other one is they have coal, they have a coal uh, fired plant, and then they have a waste to energy plant, Covanta, they take uh, all the refuse from a large part of the island, they burn it uh, in a mass burn pit, they have water running through uh, the side walls uh, of the plant, and, and that water turns to steam and that steam generates electricity. So they do have that, but mainly it's diesel. If they had the ability to have LNG there, that would be a big win for them because uh, the uh, price of electricity would go down and also the emissions on the island would go down. I did wanna also say, I think that there is a big future for hydrogen, but like Dan currently said, uh, hydrogen, for instance, being produced by just sunlight and water, that is completely possible. You can do that, but the technology to scale it up to the amount of power that we need now is just not there. I mean, ideally that would be wonderful. It's using the same process that plants use basically uh, to make energy and, and so forth. It, it uses the same pathway, very similar, but it's just not there yet. So hydrogen for a lot of companies, they, they use uh, uh, gas or they, they'll use biogas from uh, anaerobic digesters, which is basically 70% uh, natural gas. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that to what Dan said. Um, and I'm going to take, like, I think you guys both have really awesome 
high level and also highly above my head um, knowledge about some of these areas. So like my, my perspective is um, maybe it's, it's much closer to the ground um, and in a lot of ways, a little more simple, I think. Um, and that is, I see a difference in clients today versus 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, if we're being real honest, 10 years ago, there were still plenty of people out there who were kind of like, eh, climate change, I don't know if that's real or not. And I feel like that is going away in all sectors. Mm. Um, there are people who are much more willing, I think, to uh, look at renewables. And, and to be frank, a lot of people um, from a private business perspective, if renewable energy makes financial sense, well, then I'm interested. So mm -hmm. I have clients who, um, I have clients right now who have, you know, land that's been in their family for, you know, 200 years. And these are giant land holdings across the U.S. And they've maybe been growing corn for 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had asked their predecessors, would you ever take out all that corn and put in solar panels? I mean, that would have been um, offensive. And yeah. now the financial side of that makes so much more sense. And I'm not saying it's right for everybody, but solar is just a really good example of you've got people and some of it's generational and, and some of it's just the people coming around to a new way of thinking. And that opens a lot of opportunities. You know, if we're talking about careers from a legal perspective, the work I do now is different than the work I did 10 years ago because the opportunities for different businesses are different. Um, and I feel like you can also see that if you, you back up even further, um, when I got out of school, I did some of the most interesting cases I worked on were um, manufactured gas plant cleanups. So mm -hmm. this is one way they made, they like lit the streets in Southern Indiana back in the very late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and, you know, it was a great thing. It's kind of funny. There was, um, you know, there's the way they did things, you know, 150 or whatever years ago is a little different than now, but that source of energy um, was great at the time, but we now know that it ultimately left behind um, some different types of contamination that ultimately yeah. had to be remediated. And so, you know, some of the work I've done is trying to remediate this 120 year old site mm. And then, you know, I finish that project and turn around and start drafting a, a solar contract or a, a windmill zoning application. And so it's really kind of interesting to see historically how different we've looked at energy and, and all the different ways we've tried to find energy. And I think like, like Dan and Kenny pointed out, the possibilities for the future. I mean, things that at least I know I'm not able to think of right now, but, you know, by the time uh, someone who's a I don't know, a junior in college is, you know, 15, 20 years into their career. I mean, you might be dealing with things that we haven't even dreamt up yet. And I think that's kind of right. cool. Right. Agreed. So you mentioned kind of this, um, this theme of, you know, this isn't necessarily a local problem, right? Obviously you all are across the country looking at similar themes. And maybe from a more global perspective, do you see any big picture themes that are kind of the same in this industry? Either issues facing us or maybe from a policy perspective, like what is the big thing that's facing as far as maybe a complexity challenge? Complexity is, is what I would say is complexity. Mm -hmm. Is that if you think about what all of us, the things we have in common, it's that we're looking at at uh, different parts of a field from from probably a hundred different angles from the legal side, manufacturing, marketing, uh, global markets, um, trade policy, national security. There's angles of the, the, um, the renewable energy field that are bigger than just renewable energy because there's so many complex layers that go into what, what makes up how we put lights on. And um, I, I find it interesting when people mention, you know, that, Nobody really thinks about the, the utility until you turn on the light and the light won't go on. And then mm -hmm. you say, well, where is it? It should be on right now because mm -hmm. why isn't it? And so things like reliability is, is a huge part of, of the complex issue. And, and when you think about um, all of the layers that go into that kind of com complex process of, of 
generating electricity, developing energy sources. Um, it, it's layers from the macro level of, of things like the, the Biden speech, the Biden climate summit last week on down to the important part of permitting windmills in, in various parts uh, across the country or thinking through the manufacturing processes that, that impact the macro level types of things that allow us to do the technology that will solve some of these problems in, the, in our lifetime, which we need to do. Um, I, I, I think I'm kind of, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, Dan, I think, I think that's an awesome point. And so I think it also illustrates the fact that whatever your major is, whatever you dream job is, whatever job you ultimately end up with. I mean, one thing we have in common, you know, I think what Dan and I do on a daily basis is probably fairly different, but, um, the, the global aspect is I may have a client in rural Illinois, um, who gets approached by a windmill company who's owned by an LLC, who's owned by another company, who's ultimately a Dutch company using parts made somewhere else um, to provide energy maybe to the West Coast. And so uh, real quickly, this, what feels like a hyper-local, well, geez, we've got this zoning issue we got to work out. The dominoes, you know, really quickly can expand out where suddenly what feels like a, this is just, uh, you know, the issue that's facing some small county in Southern Illinois, well, no, suddenly it's got, you know, international repercussions. And then it flows back the other way where, uh, you know, my hypothetical Dutch company has issues that can real easily impact this small county in Illinois. So I think we are truly a, a global economy now. And you can see that, I think, in the three of our um, careers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I do wanna share just a quick personal anecdote about electric cars. I'm currently in Southern California and just about every fourth car is a Tesla. I've never seen so many Teslas <laughs> ever and they're really nice. And my, my brother has one and I drove it and I go, wow, this thing is so nice. It's so quiet. It's so luxurious. It's, it's so techn technologically advanced more than any other car I've driven in, Mercedes or whatever, right? Um, it's so fast. When you take your foot off the gas, it already is starting to slow down because of the regenerative braking from the electric motor, whatever. So I said, this is so cool. Why doesn't everybody drive one? Why don't I drive one? I, I'm from Connecticut. Um, and so... Then I realized one situation where it's like, okay, well, I see where this is a little issue. So he was driving me to the airport. So his wife called and said, hey, I'd like to take the Tesla from Chino Hills to Los Angeles later today. He says, you can't do that because uh, you're only gonna have like 90 miles left on the charge. So you can't take it today. Uh, you know, you have to take the other car or whatever because the Tesla to get a 90% charge with just the home uh, 240 volt uh, charge takes about, I guess, I don't know, five, six hours. No one's gonna sit around and wait five or six hours and plan their commute around that spontaneously, right? Tesla does have supercharging stations that do it within like 20 minutes, but that's 20 minutes. You can hang out, whatever. It's so much more convenient to put in a gas pump take five minutes, you can drive 300 miles. So there is that, like in rural Indiana, how many Tesla charging stations are gonna be between one location and another? I mean, you can charge at home and if you use it for just commuting and stuff, that's fine. But like I think Dan was saying earlier about something else, the technology, the infrastructure is just not there yet. I, I think it is, electric cars are pretty widespread adoption, but not nearly as much as maybe what everybody would want or think when we want to reduce global emissions and all that sort of thing. So there's some challenges there. I just wanted to bring up, no matter how great Teslas are, there are limitations. Well, from my side, when we think about the, uh, the challenges of electric vehicles anywhere, the, the, there's a couple angles that we think about. First of all, how do you get the electricity in the first place? If, it, if you're in a very cloudy, dark place, are you gonna have the electricity if you only rely on solar or wind? Uh, to be able to generate that electricity, not always. So you need to need battery technology or something to back it up. Um, when you take a step back and think uh, of if you do have electricity, no matter where it comes from, 
what kind of local fleets can use electric vehicles? So the delivery vehicles that are going around town and can go back at night and recharge. Uh, like you mentioned, the, the commuting kind of options. The long trips, definitely, there's the infrastructure is still being developed. And I think um, I, I noticed the exact same thing walking my dog this afternoon that were, there were four Teslas in a row on the street and mm -hmm. just driving down. And I thought, well, that's, it's not new to me, but it's still, it just always makes me chuckle because it's everyone seems to have one. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those people have the, the shorter commutes or they have the just drive around town kind of thing. And, um, and you're right, there are the, the problems. And, um, and as we think about the other technologies that could potentially be anywhere, um, Hawaii, for instance, and electricity there, you mentioned the, the diesel and the coal. There's issues around LNG being built in Hawaii. There's issues around renewables being built in Hawaii that would complement the existing fleet. Uh, there's potential in everything, but it gets down to the complexity of the whole, the whole system has to be rethought in certain ways. And what are the big things that we can talk about and we can tackle right now um, in terms of how we look at, at the world? Um, yeah, there's I'm going there's, on about this, but I mean, if if you're in school now, and of course anybody who's not in school can always relearn and jump in where they want. But if you're in school right now, there's such opportunity in this field, not just in the technical realm, but also in the legal, the policy realm. Just how is this all going to come together? So there's so much opportunity. I think a, a cool thing to think about with that is um, this field is so new that just because you're newly out of school you're actually not behind the eight ball that far. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're coming into an industry that's existed for a hundred years. So yeah, the old guy who's been doing it for 50 years probably does know more than you. But this field is so new that uh, new graduates, I mean, you're you're poised and ready to to be right there with anybody else because it all, all of the topic, the, the subject matter is so new. So I think that's kind of something cool to think about. And, you know, obviously, it's easier for us to preach that at you than it is maybe sometimes to believe it yourself. But I truly think that's the case. Yeah. Just jumping in on that too, um, in terms of things that I've learned over the last, over my career of thinking about what's been useful and Kenny, Kenny and Brian, I guess uh, you can, uh, you probably have the same kind of things, but primarily the things that you probably have right now as students, organization, how are you organized? How do you process information? How do you think about issues um, on a day-to-day -day basis? I have to look at, I, I look at a ton of information, digest it, and then share it with, with other people in the organization. And that, that's kind of um, the thought process is the kind of thing that I learned at Valpo is to be able to think about um, complex issues and boil them down, but also be able to keep a whole 15 different tasks organized and delivered on time, being able to write really well and being able to get my thoughts across effectively getting through the, the, um, the, this complex issue and saying, well, what are the important parts? One of the things I'm working on right now is a, a first quarter review of global energy for our senior executives. So what I'm thinking about with that is who's using what kind of energy, especially LNG in the first quarter? Are there any policies that came out? What are the prices that we have to look at? What kind of things impact our projects? And how does that impact how we do business? And it's a it's an ongoing dialogue, but at the at the core of it, I need to be organized, and I need to make sure that I get certain things done. That I I am communicating with my team, that I'm writing in a, a clear presentation for people that I'm working with, and then when I give that presentation, that I get those points across really effectively. So bringing those types of things out, I think, is are key skills that, regardless of what what major you're in right now, are useful in the long term. Um, I I mentioned that I I got my first master's in political risk and energy, and then I got a, a second master's in MBA in, in finance. And so as I think about specific skills with that, I don't use my finance degree to the same extent that I, I write a lot. I don't do a whole lot of uh, weighted average cost of capital calculations or, or the like, but it's the foundational structure and thinking through um, the structure of what someone else has already thought about in the world and saying, all right, I know that this has worked in this spot. Can I use it here too? And so breaking down a, a, a finance issue in one part, there's similar issues elsewhere. And I imagine the same is true with legal, the same is true with, with um, engineering and making sure you, you recognize some of those patterns and see where you can not have to reinvent the wheel every time you, you approach your job, I think are some key things with, that I've learned that have been useful. 
Um, Brianna, Kenny, I, I don't want to speak yeah. for you guys completely, but. Well, I think that's an awesome point. And I think it also goes back to something that both Dan and Kenny said earlier is, you know, Kenny pointed out that, you know, he was going down or, you know, you go down this path and then an opportunity comes up and suddenly you pivot. You know, Dan talked about, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm going to go work in Germany and manufacturing because I'm not entirely sure. Maybe Dan, I'm putting words in your mouth, but maybe I don't know exactly. And I think, you know, I had that too, where I was exactly, I worked in um, Peru, South America for a while, and I was going to be like our next ambassador. And now I'm an ag law attorney. Like, what does that, what does one have to do with the other? But I think the, the takeaway and what kind of builds off of what Dan was saying is you have these experiences, whether it's an internship or it's a class with a professor that makes an impact on you, or it's a, a, a job that you, you know, I bartended um, during my master's and during law school. And, you know, I don't bartend anymore, but there are skills you take from these different um, experiences and you repackage them and you use them now. You know, I, if I'm doing an oral argument in court, now it's not the same as selling somebody on the whiskey special. But you know what? There are some things that are in common there and the ability to connect with someone who has a different background than you do and, and to make them understand your point, to orally communicate that to them. Well, what's a bartender doing? Kind of the same thing. So I think, you know, when you're in college or, you know, in your um, post-college degree or, or post-college uh, work experience, even if you get to that point where you have an opportunity and you pivot and you say, I'm going to do something else because, geez, it turns out I didn't want to do that. That isn't like throw away that experience. It is, you know, think about that experience um, and what from that can you take away and, and maybe repackage and reuse. And I tell that, you know, I interview a lot of um, law students and sometimes we'll have somebody who comes in and is like, oh, geez, you know, I thought I wanted to work. I wanted to do crim law. And I went and worked for the prosecutor's office and oh my gosh, I hated criminal law. I hate that whole, and I, yeah, yeah. So, so you figured out something you don't want to do, but what skills, what transferable skills did you pull from that work with the prosecutor's office that you can, you know, turn into, you know, working in mergers and acquisitions or, or doing um, lobbying work, you know? Um, so I think that um, kind of building off of what, what Dan just said is, also being able to look at your own career path, your own educational path and pull out those little nuggets of, even if it's totally separate fields, pulling out that nugget and using it in your, um, in your next job or in your next interview or in your next you know, um, piece of your education. So I think you know, you're, you're collecting these experiences along the way and you can always find a way for them to continue to serve you even if you pivot in your opportunities or pivot in your career path. Absolutely, I totally agree. I want to follow on to that, and uh, Kenny, I'm I'm curious to hear what you have to say in the same thought. But a follow on just quickly is um, I graduated from Valpo in 2001. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years, but it has now. Mm -hmm. uh, but 2001 was the um, there 2000 2001 was a tech crisis, and the economy was not doing well when I graduated. And the year before pretty much everyone I knew had three or four offers from different companies. Mm -hmm. And when we graduated, the one person who had an offer before we graduated had it rescinded. So that oh, really nobody oh. I knew had a job, which is why I, when I saw the opportunity to go work in Germany, it was a relocations logistics option. And I'd spoken German, but it wasn't completely fluent. I didn't want to go write essays in German. I wanted to be able to use it professionally. Um, so I thought, hey, why not? I'll go for a couple of years. It was a great way to get my professional German up. Um, and that's a skill I've, I've taken with me, but I don't really use, I don't really use my German that much. My partner lives in Vienna, so I'm the one who orders dinner when we go, but otherwise it's, uh, it's not really at the top of my list, but the international affairs and the community building and those kind of things are there. When I finished my master's from GW, it was 2008. And as I'm sure you all know a little bit of, even though you were probably much, you were definitely younger then, was uh, the 2009 financial crisis when things kind of fell apart again. I didn't, I, I had a job at that point and I had one that I liked and it was a good place to continue growing, but my options were limited. And what that taught me is that what kind of skills I had were flexible. And if I had those basic skills that I could move from one place to another, one company to another, one industry to another, one geography to another, there is ways to build up a career in certain ways. 
that use all those skills. It's not the, the same kind of thing of, um, my dad's a poor example because he's a, a Lutheran pastor and there's kind of a good market generally for that and being a professor. But my grandfather worked for the same company for probably 35, 40 years and was a chemist. It's not going to be my story at all. I think every couple of years, I'll probably change somewhere or change roles within a company and those skills will be useful. And so thinking about transferable skills, thinking about the world possibly falling down behind you and how do you react to that? Flexibility is the, the name of the game, I'd say. Sorry, yeah. Kenny, I'm curious what you have to say too on that. Yeah, I was thinking about your opportunity to go to Germany. That may not have been your first choice, as you said, because the market, the opportunities were not quite there. I do remember that tech bust because I was in Seattle at that time and Amazon had soared to $400 a share, which today it's like over 3000 But anyways, back then that was a lot. And then it just dropped and it dropped to like 30 or I don't know, something like that. So I, re I do remember how things were so hot and then it cooled off really fast. And so you took what you could. And I did want to say something that there are times and moments when in your job, you're asked to do things that you really don't like to do, but you're just asked to do it. And it really sucks right at the moment. <laughs> it's just like, why do I need to do this? This is not even what I signed up for to do. Why am I doing this or whatever? But when it came down to it, you got to do it, right? As part of your job, whatever. And I want to say this. I want to say such an important lesson for me was to do it to the best of your ability. You're not going to do it forever. I didn't have to do this one particular thing forever. But like Brianna was saying, I learned so much from doing that thing that I didn't like to do. I didn't think I would, but I learned so much because then my next opportunity, I'm like, I'm so glad that they made me do that because it's like totally transferable. And what I'm talking about specifically was, I was hired as a plant manager to manage the operations of a new plant. And uh, they didn't have an engineer on staff. And so they asked me to learn all about the electrical, the mechanical, do drawings and stuff of the plant and how things flowed and everything. And my first response, and I'm not saying don't speak up if you have something you think, should I really be doing this? So I spoke up and I said, guys, listen, you hired me to be the, a plant manager, not the plant engineer, the plant head of maintenance and all this kind of stuff. And they said, we realize that, but we want you to learn all of it because one day you will be managing all those guys and we want you to know everything. I'm like, do you know how much time this is going to take? <laughs> and they're like, we want every three weeks, for you to present to us a report of the electrical drawings, the mechanical drawings and all this kind of stuff. I said, are you serious? They go, we're so serious. This is what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I had to do it. Did I like doing it at first? No, but as I was doing it, I was like, wow, you know, this is really cool understanding all this stuff. I really understand this place. And then, you know, now I head up the engineering group at the company that I work with and all those things back then really did help me later on. I think that's an awesome point, Kenny, because so like these guys were mentioning, you know, there's this tech crisis in the early 2000s, 2008, 2009 financial crisis. So, I mean, I want to just tell the quickest of personal anecdotes that was like, to me, it's proof that you can feel like you're falling flat on your face and life, you know, finds a way of working itself out because um, in law school, what you do your 2L summer, you hope that that um, catapults you or, you know, that turns into a real job offer. And, and I kind of lucked out in law school and, and my grades were okay. So I got this offer for my 2L summer at a big firm paying big dollars and doing like very fancy mergers and acquisition deals. And I just thought I was going to be the fanciest lawyer of all and had a great summer and then like the bottom fell out. This is, you know, toward the end of, you know, summer of 2008, the bottom fell out. And this firm that in the past had offered like a hundred percent of their summers, real jobs, didn't offer any. Um, I think they ended up hiring one person. So the rest of us are all scrambling. And so 
you know, I got the call, Brianna, you're, we're not going to make you a job offer. And I thought, oh my gosh, my life is ruined. This is the fancy job that I was cut out for and it's fallen apart. You know, you have this moment of panic. And then a few days later, I got a phone call from a partner at the firm saying, you know, obviously we're not going to hire you, but I know somebody who should. And here, I'm going to set you up to have lunch with them. So, and I, I had lunch with this person and I ultimately did get hired at this other firm and worked there very happily um, out of law school for many years. But it's, um, I guess it's a good, good, good point to think like right now, Kenny has an awesome job. And Dan has an awesome job. But I'm guessing that somewhere along the line, they also probably maybe not falling quite as flat as I did, but, but have those setbacks. And that ultimately, I mean, in the moment you feel like, you know, okay, I'm a college senior. I had a perfect internship and it fell apart. I'm never going to get a job. I'm going to live with my parents forever. I'm going to be in the basement playing video games and die someday. But, you know, I'm here to tell you that doesn't have to be that way. You can take those failures, you know. I got the, I was on vacation and got a phone call saying, hey, and I was like, yes, here comes my offer. And they said, yeah, we're not going to hire you. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your summer. And in the moment, you just feel like it is over and everything you've worked for, but, um, you know, stick through it. And I I think that that happens in all different careers. And then, you know, you can be surprised because I was never supposed to be a fancy mergers attorney. That would have been hilarious. Um, and I ended up at a job that was much more befitting what I wanted to do, what I was looking for, and ended up, you know, doing all these cool environmental cleanups and working on all these different projects that I didn't even know existed when I was in college. So um, I'm an example of you can fail huge and it still works out in the end. Awesome. I wouldn't even call it a failure. That's that's learning. That's uh, right. that's building on the skills that you've got and and thinking, all right, how am I going to pivot when I need to pivot? That's that's a key skill that uh, I've definitely had to learn as well. <laughs> Thank you all. That was wonderful advice, and I'm sure uh, will definitely help our students a lot. If you had to look back, so this is kind of in the theme of um, good advice. Was there maybe something that either surprised you that came in handy later? So like. You mentioned writing something like that, um, that you didn't necessarily expect to use, or maybe something that if you were talking to yourself in undergrad that you would go back and say, okay, do this thing. Um, Is there anything that comes to mind for that? There is, for me, something that definitely comes to mind, and that is advice from people that have been in the industry that you're working in actually is more important than you think it is or at least when I was uh, in my mid to early 20s, I, you know, you think sometimes, not everybody, but I thought I knew I didn't need that much advice. I was pretty good at making my own decisions and stuff like that. And of course you gotta ultimately make your own decision. But an example would be when I was uh, setting up these paint plants with this senior chemist and he said, you know, Kenny, I'm only gonna be managing this division as the general manager for 10 years. I'm retiring. I've already stated that fact. And the goal in the succession plan is, it's gonna go to you. You're gonna be the general manager. I'm training you for that. And you know what? At that point, 10 years seems like forever. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do in 10 years. I don't know if I wanna do this or whatever. So he started me right on the path of learning paint formulations and all this kind of stuff, right? And he said something to the fact back then that, you know, that salary is $250,000 a year, whatever. And to me at 25 or whatever, I'm like, okay, I don't really have a concept of what that is or that means or whatever. So you know what I did? After I was learning the chemistry and stuff like that for a while, very quickly, I said to him, this is really not for me. I do not want to be your the the heir to the throne here. I think you need to get somebody else. And and then, you know, I moved on, everything worked out. But looking back on that, I think, what in the world was I thinking? Because back then, that was a pretty good salary. And those were really good people to work with. I, I think one advice I, I would say is, uh, listen to what some of the 
experienced people have to say and take your time in making a decision. Granny, you wanna go next? I'm, I'm writing down one more thought of what I've got here. Sure, sure. Um, what, what I would say, and I, I tell this to law students all the time too, um, sometimes you need to, you know, we talk, everybody talks about networking. It's such a, like a great buzzword. Um, I'm the first lawyer in my family. So it's not like I have 15 lawyers to just, you know, easily can pick a job off the tree. And I think the same goes for any major, any undergrad kind of degree. And that is um, networking matters and who you know matters. Um, yes, what you know is the most important, but sometimes it's who you know that opens the door. And I say that not to scare you, um, but sometimes it's something like you meet somebody at an event. Now we're all virtual. I wish we were in person. And if we were in person and I was interested in, um, I don't know, some kind of a, a marketing world, I might say, hey, you know, Dan, it's been really great to meet you. Could I have your card? Um, now I know that as a college junior, there's probably not a whole lot I can do to boost Dan in his career. But you know what? I can follow up with him. I can buy him a coffee. I can, um, you know, Dan, when is best to meet for you? Are you are you a coffee guy? Was it easier to do lunch or just a phone call? And meet him where he is because he's in the industry I want to be in. So take it upon yourself to follow up with him uh, a week after the event, a couple days after the event. Hey, Dan, I was the, the lady in the green shirt. We talked for a minute. I'd love to buy you a coffee because what you said about um, working in Germany really resonated with me. Do you have any time for coffee in the next two weeks? And now I know Dan's out in California, but again, we're playing pretend. And um, if he says no, okay, what'd you lose? Nothing, right? You're going to forget he existed next week. <laughs> um, but if he says yes, well, maybe you guys hit it off. I'm not saying he's going to offer you a job, but you trade an email every couple of months. You update him when you get an internship and you never know where these things go. And I guess I've seen that play out in my career over and over again. A relationship, if you if it's something that's important to you and you nurture it and you treat the other person with respect, you don't just, I've also had somebody meet me at uh, Starbucks. I bought them a coffee and then they were like, so do you think you can hire me? And I was like, well, that's not how this works. Um, so, you know, invest in those relationships because they can be really important whether it's looking for a job or like Kenny mentioned, looking for advice. You know, if I were gonna go work, um, you know, in a giant plant somewhere trying to learn about for paint formulations, I have no idea where that starts. But maybe Kenny can say, well, I can tell you a few things I did well and a few things maybe I did wrong. Use it as you will. So I just think the, the personal relationships are um, really important. And I wish, I didn't figure that out until I was halfway through law school. Um, and in college, you know, I was, I had other interests, let's say, and I wish I had paid a little more attention to, to that side of things. I'll echo on the, the networking side of things. Um, it really hit home for me in business school because I thought I might want to pivot from more of a strategy and corporate strategy, LNG kind of world into uh, banking. I mentioned earlier that I thought I, I, banking might be a good global option, but really um, the only way to do it is that I wanted to do it, it would be to, uh, to be a, uh, at that point in my career, to pivot as an MBA into a program. Similarly, um, people ask me things like, you're a little bit old for these, this kind of thing, and said, you know, do you really want to do this? Uh, I didn't, and I realized that during the interview process, which is part of that self-reflection kind of thing, and being able to accept what you want, and put that together with what's out there, and and not just what seems cool, but what you really want to do. Um, but in the networking side of things, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, circling around this a bit, but uh, I made a point to meet with probably 60 different bankers while I was in that process of recruiting and asking them what their path was, what they liked about their job, what they did. It was that process that helped me realize that I did not want to be working 14 hour days for someone who was likely younger than me on PowerPoint slides that I could do in my sleep from my previous job, but would never be right because bankers want certain things in certain ways and they have to be uh, um, you know, just right. And sometimes they want to haze you in some of these jobs. So uh, show you who's boss. That's not for me. That's not what I wanted to do. But what I learned in that process was 
what these 50 different people had as backgrounds, what kind of things they could do with their, their experience in banking, how I could take those kind of skills and find them in different areas. And I've done the same thing since. I've made a point of, of talking to a number of different people in a number of different fields and really keeping track of that. I kept a notebook, kept notes from every interview. I said, thank you to people. I bought them a coffee. It got boring sometimes, but sometimes I learned some things. And other times um, it helped me really learn that I didn't want to go into that kind of job, which is key when you say to yourself possibly two to five years of going down a career path that you don't want to go down if you can figure that out during interviews with someone. And they, they can be completely informal. Um, I've been involved with, um, with Valpo, with uh, the Sigma Chi fraternity and with the Alumni Association. And so I have connections with people that way. And that's a nice thing where you can say, oh, you have this similar kind of interest as me and this similar kind of background. How can we connect with those kind of things? Maybe that's a more fitting way to connect with someone than to say, you know, I want a job just to what Brianna was saying. And, and that's never going to be the best way to, to approach things because somebody might not have a job. Even if they do have a job, you don't want to approach them that way and say, I, you know, give me this and, and kind of... Um, it, it shouldn't be a quid pro quo necessarily, but it should be relationship building and thinking strategically about how you can build that. The other main thing I would say is as a, as a college senior, I was comparing myself to everyone. And I would go back to that, that guy and I would say, hey, don't compare yourself to other people. You've got your own path. You've got your own skills. You're doing just fine. And life has got some good things in store for you. So think about what kind of positive possibilities are out there. I mentioned the, the 2008 and 9 financial crisis, and I was convinced that I was going to be part of one of the layoff rounds that my company had. I wasn't, but I spent six, eight months worried about that, worried about something that was not happening. And if I just focused on, on putting my efforts somewhere else, it would have been a much more enjoyable six or eight months. And, uh, and I would have gotten more out of it, I think. Um, so my two takeaways would be in networking, think about uh, how you can organize how you meet people, and then don't compare yourself to others. And that's, that's what I have to add on that one. I know we're kind of coming up against the hour here. Sure, thank you all so much, both for sharing your industry experience um, and that wonderful advice. I know that that's a really good perspective on how to approach life in general. So thank you all. Can I add one final, final thought here for, for me? Um, I saw some Valpo resumes uh, in the, the last uh, year or so in various different circles, and I would recommend two things. Number one, make sure it's polished. Take it to someone in the career center and ask them to review it. Have plenty of white space. Stick to one page. I am certain if I can fit my experience on one page, you can fit yours on one page. Don't crowd it too much. Focus on what kind of skills you can have there. Second thing with that, PDF it. Don't send a Word document to someone because you don't know what format is going to come up on their Apple versus their their uh, their um, PC, and it could just look completely crazy when they do. And then the second thing I wanted to say is, uh, as you all graduate, you'll be members of the Alumni Association. So uh, look out for programming from us and be in touch with us because we want to be um, we want to make sure that everybody who graduates is still connected to Valpo in a meaningful way. Well, Kenny. Dan and Brianna, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We know you have other things going on. We appreciate you taking time from your calendar. Jenny, thank you very much for moderating this. It was great. Students, hopefully you have some takeaways. I know I have a whole bunch. I thought it was a terrific panel. We really appreciate your time and, and interest in Valpo. Um, students, there are a couple more panels, the balance of this week. Take a look on Handshake for the schedule and check Instagram at uh, Valpo Careers for the details.